I'll be talking about something that we call hybrid intelligence. And uh, I know that when we talk about humans and machines working together, there can be a tendency that this becomes extremely fluffy. And we're saying, oh, we just need to sort of do this better than we have done before. And then we will be able to achieve some synergies that we haven't been able to tap into before. And, and I will sort of try to balance a little bit. Sometimes I will be uh, using some very generic terms like AI rather than machine learning, but I will also try to see if I can convince you that if we treat as hybrid intelligence and if we can agree on some terms, then we can also make it actionable in the sense that we can really sort of in local context ask the questions how we can achieve these synergies more efficiently. And so to start off with, I just want to, I will not say so much about my own research. Um, so I'll make sure to just mention a little bit about what we're doing in the beginning and then maybe at the end if we have time. But, but, but in our center, what we're trying to do is that we are investigating um, AI and machine optimization. For instance, we, we were looking at Alpha Zero and, and, and we were applying it for the first time sort of outside of the game world, like uh, Deep Google DeepMind did. It was actually a little bit surprised to me that we just published our paper and then Google DeepMind is citing us for, for the first people to do it outside of the game uh, realm. But then we have uh, a safe sequence of games where we study natural science problem solving. And then we have what we call a social science super collider, where we try to take studies of human interactions and scale them up using games and get thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to search to um, um, participate in this. And then we have, so that was our basic research. And then we have applied research and, and I'll not talk about our education and our games for good section, but uh, I will talk a little bit about the corporate training that we're doing and in particular also the corporate collider that we say, which is where we're trying to take these sort of basic research insights and see how do they pan out in the real world? How can we create hybrid intelligence in the real world? And I just want to start out with one example of uh, a collaboration that we have with a company called eSoft. So they uh, are doing image analysis. They have about 50% of the Danish market in terms of images for houses that are on sale. And so the, the process is that photographers go out to the houses, take pictures, and then these pictures are sent to Vietnam where there is an 800 person division that does image manipulation and turns pictures like the ones you see on the left here to, to something which uh, seems so bright and, and inviting as something that you see on the right. And so in uh, over the past couple of years, eSoft has had uh, some industry PhDs with the purpose of trying to see what they could do with AI enhanced image analysis. And, and it was extremely efficient uh, in the sense that they achieved 40% efficiency enhancement uh, throughout these couple of years. And then you could think, okay, so that's a great advance for uh, trying to automate pro automize processes and maybe they can cut their division down to 500 or maybe even more. And maybe with a little bit of extra effort, they can actually go all AI and, and get rid of that division. And so that sounds like sort of something that you could be wanting to achieve. But the background of this project is actually that in Vietnam, it was started by Danida. And Danida is a Danish organization for foreign aid. And it turns out that the majority of the employees in Vietnam are actually disabled people. So, so it's actually not a part of the core business model to get rid of that unit, but rather to see if we can find ways of empowering their workflow. And so that's why in the second stage, they sort of contact us. And then we have conversations about them to see how can we introduce hybrid intelligence into this? So how can we sort of go out, understand both the strengths and the weaknesses of both the algorithms that we could be applying and also the image processing that is being done by the humans, work in teams to sort of figure out where that interface can be, can be improved. And examples are then that, for instance, the AI can be generating a number of masks the people will apply the masks uh, to the images and then slowly both systems actually start to learn from each other, the human and the AI system. And that's what we will sort of, I'll get back to more detail about this as hybrid intelligence. I'll be talking about a lot of different topics and, and uh, I of course cannot be an expert in all of them, maybe not in any of them, but I have a lot of uh, very, very talented collaborators. So if you hear something which resonates a little bit, which you think is insightful, 
then it's probably just because I can thank many of our collaborators for insightful conversations. And if you hear something that you think sounds uh, a little bit sort of uh, uh, too good to be true, uh, then then I can apologize for for having, uh, let's say, taken taken the uh, conversations with my collaborators one step too far. I'll let you judge that for yourself in the end. I'll in particular in this talk be relying a lot on an international consortium that we are putting to place uh, around hybrid intelligence. So we have people from uh, IBM Watson, from, from Microsoft, from cognitive science, from learning sciences, and from AI uh, uh, institutes around the world. So I'll take just a brief step back now and take sort of the the big perspective of, of AI and which process we are going to be happening. And of course, these next five minutes are going to be a little bit uh, popularizing, and I apologize for that, but I need to sort of make a couple of points that I'll be sort of hammering at later on. So you probably all know Ray Kurzweil uh, and his uh, point about a singularity and saying that if you extrapolate, then at some point we will reach this uh, domain general AI, in maybe 2045 or 50 or 60 or 70, whatever. Um, I think that a good illustration of this sort of process is uh, one of the DeepMind projects that came out of uh, uh, a couple of years ago, where they had a number of uh, 80s Atari games uh, played by the uh, machine learning algorithm, Deep Neural Networks. And they showed here on the left a figure that I thought was really in, in, impressive because you have these roughly 35 games, and then there is a line sort of two thirds down and that shows sort of human level and beyond, all everything above the line and, and everything below the line, that's sort of what humans still play better at that time at least. And so what I think is really interesting is that this line has gone from us sort of being superior on all of these levels to this line moving further and further and down. And you could sort of say, okay, the singularity, whatever that means could be sort of that the line goes all the way down and we are beaten in all games. Max Tegmark has a slightly different way of looking at it when he says, he talks about life 3.0. He says that we are going to transition from life 1.0, which was simple biological, to life 2.0, which is us, which is cultural. So information can be tr culturally transmitted and not just biologically from generation to generation, to life 3.0, which is technological. And he has this image of, of sort of this landscape with different heights, and the heights are then the complexity of those. And this is what I will get much more into and get a little bit more concrete about in later in this talk. Uh, but you sort of see the ability of AI at this instant in time is sort of the water level and the water is increasingly rising. And you can see so that if you are driving, then you're sort of in a, in, a, in, a, in a tight spot. Whereas if you're doing science or art or something like that, you can expect to have a job a little bit longer. So what I want to describe is really sort of a transition uh, that many people are talking about saying that we really shouldn't be talking about artificial intelligence. We should be talking about intelligence augmentation. And all of these words are sort of very fluffy words and they don't have so much meaning, but I would argue that in the sense that all data, all AI today or all machine learning relies on some part of the process, having humans inside generating data, then you could say that we have human in the loop right now with all of our machine efforts and it is, in some sense, intelligence augmentation. And you could sort of see this techno-optimistic uh, view that what we want to be trying to do from an algorithmic point of view is to move humans from being in the loop to being on the loop. And humans on the loop means that the now the algorithms can work autonomously, but we still need the humans in order to verify that the results that come out are really valid and applicable. And then the dream could be that we can take humans all the way out of the loop and get autonomous operation. And, and one of the things that we are sort of seeing in that tendency is that we are seeing especially sort of two trends that are emerging from that. And that is that in the occupations where we are doing that and pursuing it, then we're seeing more and more of what is called de-skilling. So that means we as humans, as employees, we lean more and more on the technology and we tend to sometimes forget the abilities that we had before. There's also something called perverse instantiation. It's also called value alignment problem. That really means that um, increasingly uh, we are seeing sort of products coming out in complex environments such as uh, high frequency trading, automated new news reports or hacking of the IoT, where we can see that 
we have consequences coming out of the system actually not being uh, completely predictable because it is so complex. All of this was formulated maybe for the first time by a uh, computer scientist, well, not for the first time, but, but Stuart Russell was one of the computer scientists who was sort of first famous for saying that we really should take seriously this threat of, of the AI coming. And, and, and very tangibly, what he said was that we have a tendency when we program AI systems, machine learning systems, is that we define a cost function. And then we define the, then we create algorithms that optimize this cost function. And that can be very dangerous because as humans, we are very, very bad at first foreseeing what the consequences are of our desires sort of coming to fruition. And second of all, we actually also don't really know what it is that we innermost want. And we're still seeing that when, for instance, uh, Facebook is a system and you can sort of say, well, it, from the creators of, of Facebook and, and the kind, the ways that the algorithms work, <coughs> was it, was it really, <coughs> sorry. Was it really intentional that we that we actually wanted to create a system that not that didn't sort of accommodate itself in order to 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 make people happy, but started to change people's behavior in order to become more predictable so that you could optimize your cost function. So what he is saying is that we need to sort of introduce three laws of robotics um, uh, Russell's three laws of robotics, the machines only objective is to maximize the realization of human preferences, the machine is initially uncertain about those preferences and importantly the ultimate source of information about human preferences is human behavior and that has spawned a whole field that is now called inverse uh, reinforcement learning uh, can you so the people can you just raise your hand if you know what inverse reinforcement learning is or if you have encountered this word before okay so, so that I, I'm just looking at the pictures that I can see, and and so so the idea with that is really that you try rather than as in reinforcement learning that you have now, you define a cost function and then you define steps in order to achieve that. Then you try to engineer a process in which you can actually determine what the human, what the client, what the customer has as a cost function, as preferences. And what he's introducing is something that I think is, is really interesting on a phenomenological level, and that is what he calls assistance games. And I'll just give you just a very brief sort of introduction to what that is. You can sort of imagine that you have Robbie the robot and is booking a flight for Harriet. So it's, Robbie is the personal assistant for Harriet and is really uncertain of whether uh, this particular flight has a positive value or a negative value. And so the estimation of the value to Harriet is that it ranges somewhere from plus 60, so very good, to minus 40, which is not so good. And the question is now, how could we design a sequence of interaction such that by using uncertainty, we achieve something that achieves the goal of really fulfilling Harriet's needs better than we could otherwise? Of course, you could just do it, and then sort of the average value, the expectation value of that would be 10, so the average value of doing it would be good. But you could, the robot could also, in principle, say what he was intending to do to Harriet and then give Harriet the option of turning him off. And so it's a little bit counterintuitive that maybe help giving the, uh, the human the possibility of turning the machine off can actually be beneficial. But you can see what happens that if Harriet chose not to turn Ro Robbie off, then what does that mean? Well, that must mean then that the plan was at least in some some cases uh, beneficial, and that means that Robbie can go ahead and 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 sorry and can go ahead and 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 book the flight and has achieved a much higher expected value out of those actions than otherwise. So this is just a concrete example of how we can bring sort of like a question and answer game into the human interactions that by instilling into the algorithms that it's not certain about what the human wants, it can actually adapt and achieve those in a more efficient manner. So another example of that is uh, that you can sort of say, what uh, I talked to UK Chow for a couple of years ago and, and, and invited him over and he's doing gamification with all the big companies. And he says that there's a big crisis in the whole gaming industry at the moment, because if you look at the games, they are sort of very often copies of, of the game Farmville that you see here. So Farmville has this, this, this uh, dynamics that you, uh, that you have to, uh, that you, uh, 
uh, it plays on one thing, and that one thing is that we humans are much more fearful about losing something than we are about winning something. And that means that the result of Farmville producing lots of uh, small experimentations on changes to the game was that users seem to be preferring this time of gameplay that emerged. But this is an example that we humans don't necessarily know in the long run what we want and or our short-term actions don't necessarily reflect what we want in the long term. And so that has driven an entire industry into producing games that no one actually wants to play just because we humans have this small sort of uh, uh, weakness that we hate to lose things. So, so I think that's a good example of, of how we should not always trust all of the data that is coming in. We should know what is behind it. Another example is uh, my wife, she works in, in, the, in the wind turbine industry and, and she's very often contacted by off the shelf AI. So companies that offer off the shelf AI and, and say, okay, we can solve your problem of taking all of the data and predicting when a particular wind turbine is, is likely to, um, to malfunction. And she's saying those systems, they simply don't work because we don't have enough time to wait for enough failures to happen that we can start to train all of those. So what's important is not recognizing patterns in, in, in failure data, but actually going in and understanding how uh, an engine works and how a carburetor works and all, how all of the small parts work together and then using that in order to predict something based on small data and not based on big data. So that sort of shows how I'm sort of claiming that we can move in a, in a, in an orthogonal direction. And that is rather than taking the human out of the loop, we can take the human more and more into the loop in all of our interactions. And that's what I'll be calling hyper intelligence. Again, this is something that could be, 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 be very fluff, fluffy, but I'm trying sort of in the next 20 minutes to give you some really concrete indications of how that can really become actionable. And actionable is that rather than, let's say, I'm, it's a caricature now, uh, sorry for that, but on the left-hand side, you sort of have the tendency to treat humans as generators of data or maybe as agents that have a few degrees of freedom that are sort of available. Whereas if you really want to do hybrid intelligence, then you need to treat humans as full psychological beings. There needs to be mutual learning between the human and the algorithm. Interdisciplinarity is important. And something that I call intersubjectivity is really important. And that is that it's important that there's a theory of mind for the system. So I need to have a theory of mind of how the computer is actually thinking. And the computer needs to somehow have some theory of mind of what is actually going on inside of the black box that is me. Otherwise, we won't be able to achieve it. So now I'll deconstruct. So that was the sort of the, 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 the long term and the artificial general, general artificial intelligence. And the question that was sort of raised in, in those examples that I gave was just, is real life data really the same as and real life problem solving really the same as big data processing and 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 uh, gary marcus says for instance in his book rebooting ai that uh, there are big data processing or that there's a big difference between how algorithms are processing data and how we humans are generating processing data and so deep learning is really sort of troubled by a number of different uh, problems um, that are systemic and that's this has also come out recently for instance this this uh, deep mount breakout game, it turned out very soon after the release that if you took exactly the same code that had learned to play this game sort of at, to perfection, and then you change the, the sort of the distance from the paddle here and up to the, uh, uh, up to the bricks by just a single pixel, then it wouldn't work at all. So that means that there are more and more indications that these deep learning systems Although they may be functioning well, they also have a tendency to be very brittle and not very robust. An example of that is, is in this nature paper, Deep Trouble for Deep Learning, where it shows that a couple of these small stickers here causes the algorithm to interpret the stop sign as a 45 miles per hour sign. So that's obviously a problem when you are trying to program self-driving cars. And that's why estimates of self-driving cars are more like this will happen in 2085 or something like that and not around the corner. So I think that, that a good illustration of, of sort of the techno optimist versus the techno skepticist or, or realist picture is uh, Andrew in 2016, Andrew Ng, uh, he said that if a typical person can do a mental task in less than one second of thought, then we can probably automate it using AI either now or in the near future. 
And what Gary Marco says in his book is, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, and we can generate an enormous amount of directly relevant data, then we have a fighting chance. But only if the domain of the training data doesn't change too much over time. So that shows that there are lots of successes, but there's also a lot of caveats to where we can use these systems. And I'm not saying that they are not successful. I'm not saying we shouldn't pursue AI systems or machine learning or deep learning systems, but being aware of the strengths and weaknesses really can become the key to how we can build those hybrid systems. So why is it that it is working so well in many instances? Well, for instance, in Amazon book recommendation systems, it doesn't matter whether the hit rate of predicting a good book is 50 or 70 or 90, because it's much, much better than scaling up bookstores and having book clerks around the world. Whereas if you have some instances like driving or other instances where you have the life on the line, then you need to be right 99.999% of the time. And then all of those outliers that are usually sort of thrown away are suddenly the life lifesavers or uh, not lifesavers. So, so that's really important to be aware of that difference. And now I have a small caricature more to, to sort of end this. Again, apologies, but it's in order to make a point. So if you are ever attacked by a robot, then what you should do is that you should close the door because, and you should lock it because robots currently sort of struggle to open doorknobs and put keys into doorknobs. Uh, if otherwise you are a little bit more uncertain, then you should paint the doorknob black because against the background and it will not be recognized even as a doorknob. And if you are even more in doubt, then you should put a poster of a bus or something like that on the door and the robot will not even recognize it as a door. If it gets in, then you can leave this sort of trail uh, as an obstacle course of, of banana peels. Uh, and if it gets all the way up to the first story, then you climb up to a, a high place and then you wait and you call 911 and you wait patiently because it will run out of battery pretty soon. So, so again, this is an illustration of uh, when we see some of these illustrations of robots really functioning well and folding our dresses uh, and our clothes, then what we don't notice is that the lighting is perfect for that task and it doesn't necessarily work in, in our messy homes. And so it's important for us not to have the, let's say, the wrong impression of the capabilities that we have at the moment if we want to pursue this hybrid intelligence. So I'll just give uh, the, the, the definitions of hybrid intelligence. First, before I do that, has, has anyone has anyone heard or, or heard about hybrid intelligence before? A couple of people. So again, hybrid intelligence is being used in different ways. And, and as I will try to convince you, I really would like to have a very stringent definition of what hybrid intelligence means, because if we have a stringent definition, then it becomes operational and we can start to pursue it and it doesn't become everything. <coughs> and so <coughs> we, <coughs> we put three criteria for hybrid intelligence. One is that humans and AIs have to do it together. That makes sense. The second is that they have to do it better than they could have done individually. They have to do it better together than they could have done individually. But then the last and very crucial uh, 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 criterion is that they have to both be learning from each other continuously as to solve the task. So if you fall asleep and or if you have to take one thing out of this talk, then it is this mutual learning criterion because that's the important part. If you want to be designing systems that are increasingly hybrid intelligent, increasingly synergetic, then you should always ask the question, does the AI respond in a personalized way to the way I act? Or is it just something which is hard coded from the beginning? And also, do I, when I interact with the algorithm, really get a sense of how the algorithm is operating so that I can start to adapt my actions to fit optimally to that? And so some of the things that we have to consider is the computational complexity, the data constraints. So very often it's very ill-structured data that we will have uh, uh, in these sort of messy real life situations. There's dynamics, there's cost of errors that I talked about, there's uncertainty, and we really have to hone in on this de-skilling concept. So I just want to briefly talk about chess because some people are saying, okay, chess is really sort of a perfect example of how hyper intelligence can, can, can sort of evolve because in 1997, Kasparov uh, lost to Deep Blue, 
And after he lost to D Blue, a new, completely new form of chess emerged, uh, which is sometimes called cyborg or freestyle chess. Does anyone know this kind of chess? Just raise your hands if you know this kind of hybrid chess. Okay, not so many. So, so that's really, it's really fascinating because it turns out that so there are whole tournaments now where you are allowed to have a chess computer and it's not how good you are, but it's about how good are you together with your chess computer or even in a team and you're playing one team with a computer against another team with a computer. And these are called centaurs. And in 2005, it, it was actually, there was a big tournament and, and, and what Gary uh, said about the winning, that the winning team that came out was really foundational said that the weak human plus the machine plus a better process was superior to a strong computer alone and also superior to a strong human, so a strong chess player, a strong machine and an inferior process. So it really shows how in these complex situations, it's not necessarily about being sort of best at, at best at sort of, or, or putting together people who are best at something, but it's really the synergy about them that is perfect. So this seems to be sort of a, a hybrid intelligence advertisement poster. I want to uh, make, actually I'll skip that one and then I'll just talk about the second one. I really want to talk about chess and, and when you see maybe uh, Alpha Zero and uh, playing it better and better, Alpha Zero has beat the best humans, Alpha Zero has not beat the best combined sort of cyborg uh, games, uh, teams, but it may in the future. And this is not a proof that hybrid intelligence doesn't work. It's a proof that chess is actually not an example of the challenges that we're seeing in the real world. Chess is highly foreseeable, highly mathematical, and, and it doesn't have any of the complexities of multiple stakeholders and noise that we will see in many of the sort of modern applications. So I just want to give you one example now of, of hybrid intelligence that we can sort of consider a continuum from computer alone solving a problem to the truly hybrid intelligence scenario. And I don't know, has any of you had experience with, or maybe knowledge and heard about uh, uh, smart algorithms in product design? So, so there's a revolution in, in product design where algorithms are now sort of searching the search space of products and then periodically humans or experts can go in and say, ah, okay, this is, these constraints should be are here violated. They should be clarified a little bit and gradually sort of uh, really fascinating products come out. Has anyone uh, heard about this or experienced that, have working with this? Again, a couple of people, but, but I mean, so there's, there are fascinating, fascinating sort of uh, illustrations that you can see where where you have, for instance, uh, cockpits or, or plane parts and General Motors is designing their new parts for the cars to in this process where genetically uh, mutation for mutation or wrong, round by round, the uh, algorithm search through a huge space of, of, of different families of kinds of solutions and then completely new structures that are lightweight but still have the right functionality emerge. Um, I'll give a, an example from one of our collaborators, Sebastian, who, uh, who has a, an, an algorithm, uh, so genetic algorithm, and then he has a num that genetic algorithm spawns a number of Super Mario game players. So it's agents playing Super Mario, and none of the agents actually know how to play Super Mario sort of from end, from beginning to end. So but, but what he also has is a team of humans that are looking at all of the agents, and then the humans are saying, oh, that agent actually has figured out the sort of the sub move of jumping up and then jumping onto the monsters and killing them that way. And so they point to that one and then that agent is selected out along with some other ones. They are then merged and mutated and generates another sequence of, of, of agents. And then slowly, iteratively in the process, then sort of insights go from the human mind and into the product, the, the products or, or the game or agents. And so what I, what I want to sketch out for you here is, almost irrespective of which sort of area of work you have, I think at least you could think about this spectrum here of saying that you have a problem and it could be solved either by an AI alone, it could be solved with human in the loop, but where it's only the AI that learns or the human could be the only one learning or we could be having hybrid intelligence. So the first category is something, for instance, 
uh, Alpha Zero, playing StarCraft. Uh, you have these uh, algorithms that sort of just try out lots of different options, learn by itself, and starts to optimize that initial um, cost function uh, using often re reinforcement learning. Uh, then you have human in the loop where it's only the AI that learns and you can sort of say, okay, here, the example that I gave before is one of them, or you can have uh, StarCraft players and then Alpha Star will look at, will look at how, observe how they play and try to mimic that. And there's also a lot of robotics companies that are sort of saying that you observe some of the human motions and then you try to see whether you can create an algorithm that mimics that or learns from those kinds of motions. And, and again, if we do that, and there's no learning on the human side, then the humans risk being sort of, um, let's say, uh, uh, demoted to being just data uh, data generation machines. And I think that's that's what we should try to avoid. Um, the human could also be the only one learning. And here's an example. Um, does anyone know Pig Breeder or Art Breeder? So I can highly recommend if you have a little bit of time, then uh, do like Playden and go in and and go to uh, artbreeder.com or pigbreeder.com. And this is a, sort of a really fantastic network where, where a lot of pictures, images are generated with a GAN underneath. And then you can sort of, you can merge those images and then you can generate very, in very few moves something which is extremely artistic because it has sort of the hard programmed uh, uh, feature recognition of millions and millions of images underneath it. So this is a place where you have a hard-coded algorithm, and then the human starts to learn how that algorithm actually works and utilize it in their own creative processes. But of course, the best that we could do is to have both at the same time. The human is learning, and also we have a system that is adapting to the personal preferences. In my, in, uh, as far as I know, uh, in terms of these embodied agents, no one has gotten into this hybrid intelligence uh, sphere. So, so if you get there, that would be really cool. Um, so, so just very briefly about how we humans learn, we need to sort of dive into that and have a deeper understanding of that. Kahneman talked about system one, system two, the fast and the slow types of processing that we can have. You can also think about whether we as humans are sort of, if you are interacting with someone, you have a human in the loop, is that human sort of interacting via common sense, something that we can all do? We have some social or emotional or 21st century skills that we don't really know what are these intangible skills, or is it domain expertise, which is sort of coming to play? What do you need to be facilitating? Is the learning not going on at all? Is it unconscious, so just sort of trial and error and not so reflected, or is it deliberate learning that's going on? All of these things are things that you can sort of support as you create systems that have synergy between them. I think that one of the things that inspired me, at least in this process, was this commonality of a, a language between the reinforcement learning and the optimization algorithms, where it's really about having a cost function and then a search in a landscape. How many of you are familiar with optimization as a search in a landscape? So basically, if I have a cost function, I can define the height as the, 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 the quality of the product, and then the axes, that could be the two or a thousand of them, is are the parameters deciding on my solution. So that means for any location in, in that parameter space, the height is the quality of the solution. And what I need to do is just climb to the top. And there are two ways of, of searching that landscape. Either you can sort of just climb, do hill climbing, that's called exploitation, or you need to explore the landscape because you might have multiple peaks. And this exploration and these multiple peaks is actually sort of one of the biggest challenges overcoming that, that the uh, modern machine learning has to overcome. And that's actually exactly where we humans may have our strengths because that's what we call a leap of faith or a leap of intuition is that we have not so much intuition, we have not so much data, we don't know the whole landscape, but somehow we sense that moving in that direction will be beneficial. And so maybe by thinking of it in terms of these sort of common lines, we can actually um, we can actually start to uh, uh, integrate these systems more efficiently. I also want to just point out to you these different types of tasks and challenges that you could be having. Um, there are there's this transition from simple to complicated to complex to chaotic. 
Uh, can, can I again just ask how many of you are familiar with this sort of transition? So, so the idea is really that you have two axes. You have sort of the axis of how many stakeholders do I have that need to agree on a solution? So from saying, okay, everyone agrees and to multiple people agree, have to agree and they are wildly disagreeing from the start. And then there's the axis of the problem. And that is either both the problem and the solution are clear. That's an easy problem. If the problem is clear, but the solution is not clear, that can be an analytically complex problem. NP hard problems fit into this category here. And then if neither the problem nor the solution is clear, then we get to the cognitively complex problem. So you can say NP hard optimization problems lie here. Posing a research challenge or coming up with a new product design is, is up here. And ending poverty and climate change is all the way over here. So really, we need to be aware of these different types of tasks that we have, these different types of uncertainties that can exist in the system, and how to program that into our, into our algorithms. And for that, I just want to advertise, this is the last book that I'm advertising for, Range by David Epstein, because many people say that what, or at least in all, a decade ago, uh, the, the, the knowledge was that if you want to become an expert, then you need to train for 10,000 hours. And Tiger Woods was an example. He was very good at playing golf when he was two years, and he just kept playing and playing and playing and playing and playing. And what David Epstein found out was that Tiger Woods is actually not a good example of people who are very good in, for instance, sports. And a better example is actually Roger Federer, who hated playing tennis when he was young. He played lots of different sports. And, and, and he was at some point uh, 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 asked if he wanted to go to the elite team. And he said, no, I would rather play with my friends. And still, he's maybe the best player in tennis ever. And that is because he has been sampling a lot. And, and so that means that the new insight is really that if you want to be good at something, then uh, the breadth of the training predicts the breadth of the transfer. And for that, for instance, if you want to be really good at free throw shows, throws and basketball, then the new insight is actually you should not be practicing all of your shots exactly from the line. You should be stepping a little bit beyond the line and before the line and trying to adapt. And by learning to adapt, then you also become better at these challenges. And that exactly means that we humans should be good at doing exactly what the deep learning algorithm for breakout was not good at. That is being able to adapt to challenges and changes in the problem. So if we can be better at that, then maybe we can also make use of that. I'll skip the 21st century skills and then just show uh, uh, in the end here a couple of different sort of uh, examples of types of tasks that we have. And it, if you think of any kind of uh, product design or implementation, then you have a number of different sort of uh, uh, cycles uh, or uh, steps in the cycle. You have data acquisition, data prediction, data judgment, action, and then question, and then it goes around in this loop. And one way of having algorithms or hybrid intelligence is to have algorithms or hybrid intelligence in one part of it. And what we often do is that we have hybrid intelligence or AI in the data prediction. So we do data analysis and data prediction from this. And what we should be doing and pursuing is to say, how can we get algorithms in all of these five different stages? And how can we merge that with what we are already doing now? So I'll give you three brief examples of how there's an image classification, which is just sort of a simple a problem. It may be complex uh, to solve, but it's well known. Then I'll show you an example of an air traffic controller, which is a single person but has a lot of complexity, and then corporate decision making, something that, that has lots of different stakeholders who need to be aligned. So the first one is the image uh, identification. So that's a small part of the process and the systems that we're currently sort of designing in order to take information out of the human and AI system is that you could be playing a 20 questions to the professor uh, game to the human where you're saying, please identify the beak or the eye, Please identify the character, the characteristic uh, color, and then gradually sort of you, the system can hone in on what kind of species this is. The air traffic controller is much more interesting because this is a case where there's both uh, a lot of uh, data judgment and action. And uh, the case of an air controller is that you 
uh, that you, as an air traffic controller, then you have a number of flight strips that shows continually in time where the position is of each of the planes that you're responsible for. And then you have to check each one of them uh, in, a, in a cycle, and you have to check if something happens that doesn't uh, match up. And, and, and one of the interesting cases in this is that uh, in the Paris airport, they have someone who is called the cowboy. Um, and this guy, this guy who's, the, who's called the cowboy, he loves to create small disasters, small but manageable disasters, where he sort of brings two things almost into conflict, and then he resolves it. And that seems to be annoying to all of his colleagues, but every time there's a major disaster happening, they all know that they have to call on him because he has continually practiced himself in solving these sort of ad hoc situations that emerge. And the final uh, uh, example that I wanted to show is in a corporate system, for instance, uh, you have a make or buy decision. Does anyone know what a make or buy decision is? So in companies, in companies, you often have to sort of decide whether a small part of your product should be produced or should be, or should be bought from, from, from sort of sub, sub deliverance, uh, sub delivery. Uh, and, and the case of this is that you have, in order to make that decision, you have, uh, you have customers who can give you data maybe on this. You have a business analyst who, who can give you some judgment and you have a manager who needs to do the decision making process. So, so the real system, the hyper intelligent system that optimally makes use of this is machine learning algorithms that connect each of these, uh, uh, in the different parts of the process. And what I want to, I just want to flag this here is that the human learning that you could be focusing on when you're doing it, you could be asking, can we create a system where the human learns about the context, about the situational knowledge? Can we create a system where the human learns about themselves, so drives meta reflection? Or can we cause a system, create a system where the learning is about the model, the underlying structure? And if we can do all of those things, then suddenly we sort of get the, well, then we get all of the creativity that we maybe could be losing on this end, this side of the, of the spectrum. Okay, so I'm not going to, I promised you I was not going to talk about my research and, and I knew that my time would be up for that. Uh, so, so I'll just briefly say that in, in this super, social science super collider, we are trying to take these games, scale them up and try to do exactly that part of the story, which is get more insights about how we humans act on large scale. Uh, we have these games. Uh, one of them is, one of them is that we have, we're trying to do cognitive profiling at scale. We have 20,000 people playing cognitive profiling games, and then we get these cognitive profiles, and then we can start to apply them to various different corporate or problem solving contexts and find out how do people who have good uh, reaction time or good working memory attack certain different problems. I think that's really an interesting, fun, fun uh, area of research. We also have a portfolio of games where we can try to assess creativity and, and I want to just advertise to you, maybe, if you have a little bit of time, then you can go to Science at Home and you can play our Art Breeder uh, game where we have combined together with the UN in order to get players to use this human AI creativity system that I also talked about, Pig Breeder and Art Breeder before, together with Sebastian, uh, where people can gradually grow images that represent either utopian or dystopian uh, visions of the future. So I, I hope you will uh, look at that and, I, and uh, I will go to my ending slide saying just happy to have heard of you and, and, and if you have any ideas for collaboration, I would love to collaborate.